on Billion Dollar Moves, we don't shy away from difficult conversations. A heads up here, in today's conversation, we will be talking about mental health, including suicide. Know that if you are struggling with your own mental health, that you are not alone. Please reach out to a local mental health provider for support. And for a list of free support lines available around the world, we recommend bekind.findahelpline.com. Now let's dig in. I couldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. I became addicted to sleeping pills. I, I, I couldn't function physically because of what was going on inside my head. And it was terrifying. I became quite I'd suicidal and wondering whether I could continue. Yeah. And as I recovered from all of that, I learned how to fight for my life. I learned when things are hard, what to hold on to. I learned how to start to proactively look after my mental health and build some of the skills that of resilience that I didn't have before. On Billion Dollar Moves, we're all about surfacing what we call the unexpected leader, unicorn founders and funders across the globe in the pursuit of the next big thing in tech and venture. But one thing I've always known beneath these conversations that I don't always get to bring to the fore are the inevitable dark moments along the way and the immense cost to our mental health, the anxiety, the toll on our personal relationships, the toll on ourselves in taking this risk. So, in conjunction with World Mental Health Day, I'm thrilled to be bringing you a slightly different but very special episode that I think will be important to you as you build, lead, and invest better. My next guest is my friend Alicia London, a global mental health champion and leader who has worked with organizations spearheaded by the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, Selena Gomez, Lady Gaga, global organizations including the World Economic Forum and United Nations, funders, advocates, and charities around the world to bring mental health to the forefront of global conversations and call for increased action and finance. In 2017, drawing from personal personal experience, Alicia founded United for Global Mental Health, addressing the glaring gaps in mental health initiatives worldwide with a particular focus on accelerating funding. Today, she is the founder and CEO of Prospera Global, supporting global businesses, philanthropists and investors to design and deliver effective mental health solutions in their countries and around the world. She also sits on the Rare Beauty Mental Health Council and the Kate Spade New York Social Impact Council. I know I say this often, but you don't want to miss this one. Of course, it is UNGA. Mm -hmm. It is a big week in New York where climate is fun front and center, mm -hmm. health is front and center. And I'm so glad that mental health is finally getting the airtime it so deserves. Yeah. Yeah. So to get started here in true Bill and Dollar Moves fashion, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you. Great to be here. First question, as always, is yeah. context frame for the audience here. You know, we've mm -hmm. got uh, some of the best funders and founders in the globe uh, that have been on the show that mm. are high performers and are, of course, very interested in mental health because in many ways, as we talked about previously, yeah. um, this is something that we all experience. You know, mm -hmm. where many of us are frankly on the brink of mm -hmm. burnout, breakdown and all of the above. And you had an experience in 2013 that brought you to this work. Tell us a little bit about who you are and mm -hmm. how you found yourself in the space. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for asking. I think it's so important we ground all of these conversations in personal stories because mm -hmm. this is so personal for so many people. Yeah. For me, I'm honestly, I had never even thought about my mental health mm. until I turned 30. It was 2013. I was living in London. So I'm Australian, living away from home. And I was at a time of my life where things were going well. Yeah. And my work was really taking off. I was just about to do an MBA. I um, was expecting to be engaged yeah. and really what I thought to be thriving. And then one day, it was actually the day before my 30th birthday, I had suffered a trauma. Mm -hmm. And um, without going into the details, um, which I try not to relive too often, yeah. but it was the kind of trauma that led to a series of losses in my life. So relationship, um, community. I, I was so unwell, I couldn't work and took me around three years to recover. And as someone who had never struggled with my mental health before, the, the experience itself was the most shocking thing to not be able to get out of bed, to not be able to stop crying, to I couldn't eat, I couldn't sleep. I became addicted to sleeping pills. I, I, I couldn't function physically because of what was going on inside my head. 
and it was terrifying. I'd never experienced anything like it. It was like the world was one way. Yeah. And then the next day it was different and I didn't know how to be in that world. Um, it took me about um, six months or so to be able to proactively reach out for help and actually want it. Until that point, I think I was just spiraling. I was crying. I was having panic attacks on the street, unable to function. And when I finally reached out for help, um, I was diagnosed with PTSD. Um, I really struggled with depression for the next few years. I ended up leaving London, moving to New York. It's a strange place to come when you're looking for recovery, but it was actually incredible. The, The support was so good here. My friends were here. And I just recovered for three years, um, got a dog, um, learned how to live again. And in that time, I learned what it meant not only to treat a mental health condition that I was living with, not even, um, not even treat it, but even struggling with things like I I became quite suicidal and wondering whether I could continue. And as I recovered from all of that, I learned how to fight for my life. I learned when things are hard, what to hold on to. I learned how to start to proactively look after my mental health and build some of the skills that of resilience that I didn't have before because I'd never had to build them. And as a result, I really did build a foundation that I know is strong and as troubles come, as they always will, <laughs> many people, how to how to handle them yeah. a- emotionally in a way that is strong. So in a weird way, I never intended to work in this place. Even as I recovered, even as I recovered from my time in New York, I moved back to London. I never intended on working in this space. Yeah. But one day I was invited to be the campaign director for the Heads Together campaign for the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry. And the question was, do you have any interest in mental health? And I wondered whether my sitting on a psychiatrist's couch for the last three years qualified me, but it was more my experience in campaigning and advocacy and fundraising, which was my profession, that I was able to bring those skills into an issue and, and, and learn how do I bring my skills into an issue I've become to care about. Yeah, thanks for sharing, Alicia. And, and if I may just ask, because this is so important and what you're sharing is so important for so many that are tuning on in yeah. here. Um, you talked about that point of being suicidal, yeah. but then there was a point where you then decided to reach out. Mm-hmm. How does someone who's, you know, at rock bottom then shift to say, okay, I need to get out of this rut? I was hurting so badly I wish I'd reached out a bit earlier, Mm -hmm. but I was, I guess, just ashamed of the thoughts that were in my head because we're not really taught how to do that reaching out, right? So I didn't know how to go about it. I didn't know how people would respond. And the incredible thing is every time I reached out for help, the, the support was there from friends, from professionals. All those fears and the stigma that came along were going on inside my head weren't what I was facing in reality. I was really fortunate. Discrimination and stigma is something we really have to address because my experience is not the same for everybody's, but mine is certainly when you reached out for help, I really don't think I had another choice. I I couldn't keep not getting out of bed. Mm. And my faith played a really big part in that, knowing that I was here for a reason, that as long as you're breathing, there is hope. There, it is it is possible to recover from struggling with depression, anxiety, PTSD. It's possible to live a full life, even if you live with these challenges. Um, suicide's preventable if you talk about it and get the support that you need. And I had a few friends who reminded me of that. Yeah. So as I reached out for help, um, it was interesting, and for anyone that's listening, I, I can still remember my thought process one day sitting in my bed in the East Village, really at the end, and I was I was scared and I, I was in a lot of pain and I didn't know where to go, and I thought I'd reach out to one of those text lines, like, like crisis text lines, to just to chat to someone, and I was even scared that that would be traced back to me and impact my career, and it's not at all. They're completely anonymous, mm. confidential, but I did reach out. Um, after a good three or four hours of debating 
whether this is a good thing to do or not. And I reached out and there was someone at the end of the line who just listened to me and helped me to get the connection I needed. And then when I, when I did reach out and to speak to a professional, they actually just told me what I was going through was normal. And yeah. that really surprised me because the messages I'd had from a lot of people were, um, why aren't you better? That thing that happened mm. to you, just write in your gratitude journal and you'll be fine. And I was in so much pain. I, was, I felt there was something wrong with me because I couldn't do those things and be okay. And when I met with a professional, they said, no, 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 you've gone through this experience. It's like if you broke your leg. Yeah. If you were instantly able to run and you didn't go through a healing process, um, he's like, I would actually be quite worried. That's not yeah. normal. Exactly. <laughs> so same with a trauma. This is a normal process and we can work through that. You can recover and let's just do that work. Yeah. And I realized there was a way forward. Yeah, so amazing. And, and I think I was sharing with you, I was tuning into Selena Gomez that I know you work with. So we'll talk a little bit about mm -hmm. the work that you're doing with her a little bit later. But yeah. what struck me in the documentary that she did, the special that she did, was the fact that she was diagnosed with bipolar mm. uh, disorder and that it had a label to it mm. was freeing. Mm. Because when you know what's going on yeah. and you have a professional that is there to say this is what's happening and this is how we can respond. It is freeing. Something magical happens when the third quarter ends and the fourth quarter begins. The energy changes. The fourth quarter is where games are won, where champions are made, and in business, it's where sales teams become legends. That's why HubSpot built Sales Hub to give sales reps the deal-making tools they need to win in Q4 and close the year strong. Sales Hub's prospecting workspace organizes your schedule, goals, and to-do list in one place to save your team precious fourth quarter time. Smart sequences help sales rep close deals faster than ever, and with an easy-to-use deal management tool, reps can find, track, and close deals all in one place. Plus, AI forecasting helps you accurately predict future success, which means less hoping for deal and more crushing targets. Put your sales team on the fast track to winning Q4 with Sales Hub. Learn more at hubspot.com sales. A lot of what you talked about, the shame, mm. the fact that people belittled it, um, that is so critical to why we're not where we have to be. Yeah. And the fact that in health and disease, we always, you know, it's always a, there's a situation, let's handle it, but it is physical, tangible, whereas mental health, it is not. And where do you think this stigma, which in America, I will say, it's a lot better. Of course, you know, I'm from Malaysia where, you know, we just yeah. don't talk about our problems mm -hmm. because, hey, look at your privileged life. You know, you have food on the table. What do you have to complain about? Mm -hmm. I think absolutely. There, there is still a lot of stigma around the world. Um, and I would, I think it's important to say in discrimination, particularly if you live with a mental health condition or you're struggling, that needs to be addressed because we all have mental health. Sometimes we're well, sometimes we're unwell. Just with physical health, it's, it's, it affects all of us in different ways, some more seriously than others. Mm -hmm. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. I think why we've had it for so long, so when we measure stigma, we measure attitudes, behaviours and knowledge. And so where does the stigma come from? I think it comes from a lack of knowledge, mm. of not understanding what a mental health condition is. It's not your identity. This was the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge and Prince Harry coming together to address mental health across the country. And the vision was to have a national conversation, mm -hmm. open up th those conversations to raise a lot of funds. So it was, it was in 2017, um, Heads Together was the official charity partner of the London Marathon. Wow. And we saw so much shift. And this was not a time when there was a lot of conversation happening about mental health. I felt privileged to be part of something that had such a significant impact mm -hmm. across the country for so many individuals that we talked to and to the charity partners that were all involved and, and received the funds from the campaign right. and the things they've been able to create and do as a result. And I think for me, I mean, I have to say, I still remember the first time I talked about my mental health challenges mm -hmm. in a setting that wasn't amongst my psychiatrist, psychologist or my closest friends. And it was a bit scary. Yeah. But suddenly to be able to work in mental health and understand what was happening and why, I, I did really feel very, very honoured to be in that position to learn from so many experts around what needs to change. And yeah. then take, it was my experience that heads together that really made me realise the 
huge global need. Mm. So I still remember one night reading a report. Um, I was actually sitting in Kensington Palace one night, stayed back, and I was wondering why I hadn't heard about mental health globally before, and I'd worked in global health beforehand, and I read that the total amount of global funding in mental health was $135 million, aggregate funding across all countries Wait, $135 million. million. So venture capital, just to give you context here, right. that's how $100 billion a year. Right. Billion in yes. a year in the U.S. <laughs> exactly. I so, am shocked by that. So global funding, so if we're tracking across borders, I was, I was floored wow. by it. And there was this graph. It was from the Overseas Development Institute. You track the increase in funding of different health conditions. So increase of funding for HIV over the years, as it should, of um, increase of funding for maternal health, fat, really important mental health is just a flat line along mm. the bottom of the graph. Because it's been so stigmatized for so long and because it hasn't been funded it's, and there's a there's a, almost a, a ripple effect when one funder starts to fund others well but it yeah. hadn't really happened in a significant way with a global perspective really ever before. There are a few incredible organisations championing the way but that that really stuck with me from that time and it was as a result of that experience reading that report I never thought a report would have that much impact on my life but that I that I launched United for Global Mental Health with my co-founders and a range of advocates from around the world here at the United Nations in wow 2018 to try and change that on the global level and so back then, I think we were chatting about this, the number was in domestic health budgets. Is it 2%? That's right. About On average, 2% of a national health budget goes to mental health. And health budgets are mm-hmm. tiny as it is and under a lot, of, a lot of strain right now. Yeah. And it was actually even during COVID, 83% of governments stopped or reduced their mental health budget from that nominal beginning. Wait, this is confusing for me. Mm. Didn't we get a shock in the system because of the pandemic by the rise of alcoholism, depression, anxiety? We did. And yet the budgets reduced? They were. Budgets everywhere were were stressed. Right. I, I remember talking to advocates in countries like Liberia and Tonga and, and small countries where budgets are very, very stretched as it is with Mm -hmm. systems shutting down. People couldn't get to clinics, hospitals. Um, And in some countries where there's limited uh, mental health providers or supporters, experts. Sierra Leone has one one psychiatrist. psychiatrist. And and that's the kind of place like when you couldn't travel, the systems just shut down. So, yes, it did increase. Mm -hmm. The conversations increased. the need has increased, so on average, a twenty-five percent increase in depression and anxiety worldwide, and even even with mental health being expected to be the number one cause of disease by depression alone by twenty thirty, I can't stress how neglected it's been. Even then, but there is a, the glimmer of hope that I saw. I saw companies in the private sector go in the other direction. Hmm. So CEOs suddenly had to look after the mental health of their teams. And the the biggest shift I saw during COVID was companies who I was struggling to get on board to this agenda beforehand suddenly making this a priority because they had to. So tell me more about this. I mean, you started with the Duke and Duchess with Heads Together as a campaign to raise funds for the charities that worked in this space. In the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom. Yeah. That gave you a, a little bit of the lay of the land of mm-hmm. what people are doing. And then you go on to found your own mm-hmm. movement in 2018. Yeah. What were the gaps that you saw when mm-hmm. you were sort of analyzing the charities and the approach in the UK that you want to take to the globe? Yeah, there were quite a few, actually. I spent a good six months just traveling the world, talking to experts to to understand what they were. There are many, many gaps, but the things that are really crucial to achieving change, I think having having a strong civil society voice that is providing guidance to companies, to governments around what that should be, what we found almost universities, we hadn't had that civil society advocate voice around what needs to change. 
um, very, very small charities in most countries. Some countries like the US, Australia, UK, Canada um, do have a stronger civil society. Um, mm-hmm. They've had some more domestic kind of prioritizations over the years. But across the board, we haven't seen a global movement of advocates coming together, calling for change. And so that was one thing. Um, funding, as we've talked about already. And that's really significant because what we saw in some countries, the national crisis lines are being run by volunteers. Mm. And that infrastructure was missing across the board. And so you've got a lot of, what I saw was a lot of people really working to achieve change without that sustainable base of funding yeah. and infrastructure and backing to really achieve the change that's needed at scale. Having the available resources of people being trained to provide those yeah. services. The waiting lists in many countries are so long to get access to mental health care. The vast majority of the world won't have access to anyone because there aren't enough people that are trained or available as well. Yeah. So, so many challenges with the stigma on top of it as well. Systemically, when you look at it, I mean, and we chatted a little bit about this in that because it's suddenly getting the spotlight with the pandemic, yeah. um, everyone has had their own lived experience. Yeah. And they are passionate about solving this and, and wanting to create a solution for everyone. What needs to change in the system? What What is the best approach for us to really move forward and actually do the right thing in this time? It's a big question. Yeah. <laughs> it's a really big question. What I would say is, and it's important to say, especially with the people listening from around the world, we I have to hold both that every country and every context is very specific when it comes to mental health. And in countries, there are experts who mm-hmm. know the major challenges that those countries are facing. And that's different from Malaysia to the UK, to Australia, to Nigeria. And so the, I think the first thing I would say before going into the practicals is make sure for anyone that's wanting to take action, really listen to those who are the experts in the region, including others with their own lived experience. So we often say that lived experience is so important in driving solutions because you have to make sure the solutions that are putting in place are actually driving what people need and there's nothing about us without us. So making sure those with lived experience are included. Having said that, I do think it's important that the systemic solutions have come from that collective view. Mm. And for me, certainly, I wanted to make sure when I was coming in and advocating for change or working with others, I'd be listening to what's really needed and advocating for those rather than just saying this is what helped me, so this is what it should be. And I think that's really important. And we've seen a lot of um, action, which is great, but the more consolidated and strategic based on what works, the better. And the World Health Organization has released a World Mental Health Report that overviews what needs to change. And that is, I found, the most consistent overview of what's needed. And that's everything from addressing what we call the social determinants in society that needs to need to change. Sorry, what is that? What is social determinants? Social determinants mean the things that happen in society that right. are impacting our mental health. So having Mm -hmm. good access to education is really good for your mental health. Mm -hmm. Having access to green environments. Job loss is, say, negative. So you can't just take an individual and say, let's just treat your mental health. You have to take that broader view. So there's a lot of people and a lot of organizations working on what are the things that are causing mental health challenges in Mm -hmm. our world and can we address those? Right. Um, right through to then having making sure the actual infrastructure is in place to support those that need it. So making sure we're working across promotion of good mental health, prevention through addressing those more systemic structural determinants, Mm -hmm. treatment, scaling up particularly community-based care. So we do need professional care, but making sure community-based care and is it easily accessible as well as more serious um, access to support for those with serious mental health conditions and treatments yeah. um, available as well. And also recovery, protecting those who may have, like me, or re-entered the workforce after a while, after recovering. Mm. So what you're saying is we don't need uh, necessarily another mental health app. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying that. Do you know there were around ten? There are around ten thousand new mental health apps. Ten thousand? What? And and I do think it's really important. We we look and say which ones are evidence based, and the investors should be backing those. So 
there's a time for innovation. There's also a time for consolidating what works and scaling those things. And I think we need a lot more of that. We know a lot of what works when it comes to mental health. Yeah. And and there's still not enough funding for it. Yeah. So you work in the intersection of almost like policy, advocacy, and also you, for, you of course, consult with clients now mm-hmm. through Prospera. Yes. Um, through your different realms of influence, you are bringing this topic forward. And of course, you are working with some really big names. I started Prospera Global to respond to that increase that I mentioned earlier around interest from the particularly the private sector to take action. Mm-hmm. And what I started to see was some some funders, some companies, I- investors starting to say, how do we think about mental health and what's effective? And what I saw is that is moving really quite fast. We've seen it this week, the UN General Assembly side events around here, more and more private sector actors wanting to have an impact, which is amazing. Mm-hmm. And so I set up Prospera Global to be um, – a place where we can support those that want to have impact to do it well. We started really with social impact. So you've got major companies wanting to give to mental health organizations doing good work around the world. How do you find who's good? And so we've been advising those um, through to we actually also built what we think is probably one of the first mental health assessment audits for companies. Mm. So, So we can actually look across a whole company its people, its products, and its impact on society and say, here are your risk areas and here's where you can drive impact. And we're doing research at the moment around how that differs industry by industry. So if it's in gaming versus VC versus banking, where are the really material mental health related issues for each sector to focus on? And as we've done that, it's an incredible um, piece of, it's an incredible thing that we get to do to support these actors that are moving fast and having impact. So I actually have something for you. I want to give you one example of one. All right. I am ready for it. This is very exciting. So Lady Gaga co-founded Born This Way Foundation with Mm -hmm. her mother, Cynthia Germanotta. Cynthia also is a WHO Goodwill Ambassador for Mental Health. Amazing. We've been really excited at Prospera to be working with Born This Way Foundation and Cotton On Foundation, which is an Australian brand. Do you know Cotton Yes, On? of course. We love it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, love Cotton On. Um, and it's, I'm Australian. Yeah. Um, kind of they started out of Geelong in Australia uh, and my niece loves Cotton On. Kind of everyone is yeah, Cotton Yeah, we've on got tons of those shops in, in Malaysia and Southeast Asia. Well, then you can also get this there. Woohoo! What am I getting? You never know what you get on Building Dollar Moves. I love it. So. I love it. This is not just a hat. Mm-hmm. This is a hat uh, that the incredible team at Cotton On has created to support support Born This Way Foundation, 100% of proceeds from these hat sales between now and World Mental Health Day, which is October 10th, will go to Born This Way Foundation to scale up resources for young people and their mental health across 10 countries, including Malaysia. Wow. um, Good. And around the world. And then on the inside, and the reason I love this is... It, it is about fundraising and mm-hmm. the funds raised will be going through the Kindness and Community Fund to grassroots organizations supporting young people. But actually if, for you, for yeah. anyone who has a hat or maybe even buying one for a friend and giving it to them, there's a free mental health resource. So oh, I love that. There's a QR code oh. to the Be There certificate. I love it. Put on. Ooh, doesn't love Ooh, it's it. it's cute hats. actually. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you so <laughs> Very much. Cute. You know what? I don't know if you thought about this. I'm sure you, they all have. Go ahead. But the point of giving something like this, and, and I'm just thinking about, you know, the community that I come from in Southeast Asia, where it's all about achievement. Mm. And you don't talk about your problems. Yeah. Even being, like, emotionally open is not really a thing until recently. Uh, but just buying this and giving this to someone is almost like a hat tip, a literal hat tip to say, it is. Hey, I think you're going through something. Just so you know, this is like Lady Gaga is amazing. So you don't have to say it directly, mm-hmm. but then they can go and look for resources. It's true. Which and it's so great. Inside it says, I love it. It says, this hat is a hug. This hat is a and hug. Actually, there's this as well. This is from, I love this it. Is my little one as well. Oh, I've got messages. Very good. Like you are loved on the oh, inside. Very nice. But um, yeah, it's important to share these. And then the yeah. Be There certificate that's on the inside it's incredible. It's created by Jack.org in partnership mm-hmm. with Born This Way. It teaches you how to be there for somebody else. 
So it's not only for your own mental health, but yeah. if somebody was created for young people, but if someone in your life is really struggling, yeah. sometimes it's really hard to know how to be there for them. And they teach you the five golden rules through the, the free online course. Where That's the great. Are, and, and Alicia, if you there. don't mind, because we don't talk about this often, yeah. right? But how do we support someone who's going through something? What are the five steps? I mean, even yeah. with grief, um, we're often, you know, I just lost my godfather recently as well. Mm, and being there for his children, I actually looked through resources on what's the best thing to say, mm. right? Um, how do you be there without being annoying? Because everyone's asking you, how are you feeling? Yeah. How do we be there in the meaningful way for the people that we love who are going through a mental health challenge? I think being there is mm-hmm. the main thing. It's not there to fix it for mm-hmm. somebody else. I, I sometimes when somebody's hurting, you just want to fix it. But yeah. say in the situation of grief, you, you can't fix everything. But what you can do is be there for them. And so the five golden rules in the Be There certificate is number one, say what you see. So like, hey, I've noticed you've a bit, been a bit down lately. And so just recognizing and acknowledging sometimes when there's very little you can, you feel there's very little you can do just being there and being like, I'm just here. I'm, I'm not leaving. I'm, I'm here. Call me anytime. Yeah. Secondly, just showing that you'll care, you care with your actions, hear them out. This is really important. I think we do often want to tell someone what to do but it's really hard to know somebody else's experience. Even my trauma is something that um, is very unique and sp- to my experience and may impact somebody else differently. Mm-hmm. So the third is to hear them out and listen. Listening is so important to really give someone a chance to, to explain where they're at. Mm-hmm. Fourthly, knowing your role. Mm. So as... As friends, my I'm not a mental health professional. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a psychiatrist. I can't diagnose you. I'm not there to treat you. Yeah. As a friend, my role is to be there, to be supportive, and then help, maybe help you to yeah. find the right resources. Right. And it's sometimes I think if we overstep those boundaries and the Be There certificate is really amazing at teaching how to do these things. If we go too far, we can overstep boundaries, which can can cause harm but also cannot be good for for you and then fifthly connecting to help yeah so if somebody's struggling making sure and and walking with them to get the help they need so I had friends who would literally schedule appointments help me find the right person walk with me to go there just to be there and help me on those things but they weren't trying to be the person to fix it for me yeah this is a great example of the work that you're doing with Lady Gaga and her mom in this role what what is Selena doing and how are all these really influential celebrities Mm. thinking about making an impact here is it is it just philanthropic capital? Does it have to be investment capital? Are mm. they thinking about it in the right way? I think it's a great question and everybody's different. Mm. I would say, so Born This Way Foundation is scaling these resources around the world. Their mission is to make kindness cool and they do that through listening to young people. Um, Selena Gomez has launched Rare Beauty and the Rare Impact Fund. So Rare Beauty is really interesting. It's a makeup brand. Yes. And they're really mentally friendly. Communities they're building, the diversity of products. So they're really thinking about the mental health impact of their products, Mm -hmm. as well as the Rare Impact Fund that's raising funds for uh, mental health for young people around the world, resources. We're also working with a lot of companies to roll out these assessments to say, I think it's easy to think there's like 100 things you could possibly be doing, Mm -hmm. or you just a company puts in their EAP, their employee assistance program, and think you've got mental health sorted. But we're actually going into companies and and kind of running a diagnostic to say, okay, here are the main risks you have and how can we help you overcome those specific risks to you. And I think we should be more strategic and intentional when it comes to different companies. Our hope is in time as well working with some investors to really 
measure those impacts right. and help investors make decisions through portfolios. Are you investing in mentally healthy companies that are having a positive impact in the world? Yeah. We've got to do a lot of work. We're doing a lot of work on the metrics for those decisions. The Shine Online podcast hosted by Natasha Samuel is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. Natasha interviews the brightest entrepreneurs she knows to bring you no fluff advice, honest discussions about mental health, lifestyle aspects of entrepreneurship, as well as actionable strategies and success stories of those who've mastered the art of shining online in this conversational podcast. I love Natasha's recent episode on getting paid to create and was struck in particular by this phrase. Today, being on social media is synonymous with being a creator. So how will you make the most of your time on these platforms? Listen to The Shine Online wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, and of course, you just came from a meeting with a funder who is thinking about this I as did, well. yes. I think this is, a, yeah, thanks for that. It's really interesting. And I'm so delighted that more people and more funders are starting to fund. Keep going. We need a lot more of it, investing in things that work. Making sure this, the things we're finding are evidence-based, listening to communities, and that that's the thing that we would really encourage people to think about. Think about it really thoughtfully because we haven't had much funding in the mental health space yeah. as it comes in. Making sure that it's effective is the best thing we can do right now. Otherwise, and I have started to see this for some companies they take certain actions, they don't work because they're maybe not the best solutions, and then they stop. Yeah, and it's really important we we don't lose the momentum that we do oh, have. Oh, this at the is moment. such an important point and I want to spend some time on it because yeah. frankly, we're at the stage where, you know, on Billion Dollar Moves, we have a lot of founders who've had great exits. Yeah. At the expense of their mental health, right? They've driven themselves to the ground, worked super hard, mm. uh, lost their identity. And when, when they sell their company, they have no idea who mm. they are because they've been obsessed with this one problem and that's all they've been mm. doing. So mental health without many of them acknowledging it is part and parcel of what they've experienced themselves. Yeah. And now in their next chapter, many of them are looking to give back and to actually invest meaningfully. Yeah. So someone who's completely new to this, apart from their lived experience, how would you advise someone who's in a position with capital yeah. and some social capital and influence to move forward, right? For someone completely new, maybe not with that size of check that they have, but close to maybe, what would you say? I would say, listen, mm -hmm. listen thoughtfully before you act. There are experts working on this issue that have been working on it for decades. Mm -hmm. And and I would say experts and those the most affected take time to understand what's really going on before you enter with a solution or the thing that you want to bring. Right. And actually Born This Way Foundation, and they've been very intentional, they do nothing without talking to young people before they make decisions around where they'll be acting next. And I yeah. think that's really important Make sure the investments you're making are solving the challenges that they're facing at a really structural systemic level that catalyze more action. And that's really important, especially when we get into some countries that don't have strong infrastructures. You can't just invest into a system yeah. that hasn't got a strong in infrastructure underneath it. So consider funding some of those really less sexy infrastructure yeah. ecosystem things that are needed. We know we're investing in building metrics and measurements and mm -hmm. audit systems. And <laughs> those things are foundationals for, yeah. for making sure what we're doing And, is and I love how you're talking about measurement because one of the things that we have a bad reputation in venture capital for really creating toxic environments, frankly, toxic mm -hmm. work environments, because it's so high stress. Yeah. This is also a very stressful time for the markets with interest rates and all that. We're feeling the heat where job losses are yeah. all about. Uh, leaders are crunched by the investors to also figure out an exit because they need the capital outflow. Mm -hmm. How do we still create a healthy work environment in this really stressful time and tough time? I think the number one, and this is actually a legal requirement, saying the UK run a stress assessment, understand where the points of stress are happening. Mm -hmm. And it could be in certain departments. It could be after certain practices. So understand those risks. Secondly, I would say... One of the best, most evidence-based interventions that we know works at work is having managers be trained in mental health support for their teams. So manager mental health training is one of the best things you can do because we've, we know that employees don't leave because of what's happening across the country. Mm -hmm. It often has to do with 
their manager, the direct. Yeah. So if you're looking to create a healthy environment, mentally healthy environment, that's a really important one. But broadly, like there's so many things you can be doing and I think it's important to look across the board, understand yeah. where those the really unique challenges yeah. for the business are coming from and really focus on addressing those as well as some of those broader concepts of having a good culture, tackling stigma, yeah. making sure the resources are in place. I love all those examples. And of course, I want to reflect on one of the key assessments that you did. You just published a report uh, with Kate Speed, which talked about women and girls and a statement that really shook me, shooketh, I was shooketh, was the fact that by simply being a woman, we face more stresses than everyone else. Mm. Talk to us a little bit about sort of the key highlights there. We undertook at Prospera Research Point in partnership with Kate Spade, New York, on specifically it was looking at women and girls and women and girls empowerment and what role does mental health have to play in their empowerment journey. So if we're talking about gender equality, we're talking about gender empowerment, there's actually to date very little research out there on the role that mental health plays in that journey. Mm. And so what we did was we surveyed gender equality in empowerment advocates globally and we asked them what they're seeing. We asked them what role they think it takes. We reviewed the literature. So we found that mental health is not only important for a woman empowerment journey, it's actually foundational. And actually my story I think shows us really clearly if yeah. we're looking at a woman's voice choice power as a measure when she's mentally not well it was the one thing that took a lot of my voice and my choice and my power away until I could be well again. And it's like the roots of a flower. Yeah. She will thrive um, when those roots are strong, even if you can't see them. And so that's, the, that's one thing we found. The other, to your point, thing we found is the current state of what women and girls are facing worldwide is increasing levels of stress. Um, and that as we survey gender practitioners, 90% of them said they believe women and girls are experiencing increasing stresses in the world today simply by being a woman. And, and that's coming about, you know, alarming levels of gender-based violence. Women live with twice the amount of PTSD than men. It's not to say men's mental health is important. It is. Yeah. But if we're talking about gender equality and empowerment, we have to be looking at trauma. Absolutely. We have to be looking at her mental health as part of that journey. And a lot of the gender empowerment community actually is, which is really encouraging. Um, but the impact of economic job loss in women bear the brunt of a lot of the global crises going on. So it gives you a sense of just how important mental health is for yeah. for everybody. There are case studies included in the report that show organizations that work on gender equality and empowerment integrating mental health into their programs. From So from the Lower East Side Girls Club and what they're doing here in New York City, Rising Tide Capital, supporting not only the mental health of the women they invest in, but also their teams. Because we found that team members are particularly affected, especially from the forefront of working with women and girls in some of these situations. Yeah. And then Abahisi Rwanda out of Rwanda as a, a factory, a Rwandan owned factory, um, B Corp, and how they're providing mental health support for for their teams, yeah. and and then then the sustained empowerment outcomes that come as a result as a, of their work. Wow, love it. Well, it's clear that you're really working on voice, choice, and power for so yeah. many in mental health. And what a conversation! Yeah. I mean. There's so much that we can cover here, but in this short amount of time, I think we've covered good ground. Yes. And I usually end with a quick rapid fire. Okay. The first question to you, Alicia, is what's the worst advice you've gotten and the best advice you've gotten on your career? The best advice I've ever got, especially as a social entrepreneur, was don't create something because you want to generally create something. Mm. Don't be an entrepreneur because you want to be an entrepreneur. Be an entrepreneur when there's something that you see a gap in that you know your skills match against and that it burns within you because the amount it takes to, to create yep. <laughs> requires that level of alignment. I think the worst advice that I've ever received was just to take the job that pays you more. Can you share a memorable aha moment from your career? So in 2021, I was in Australia. I was I have spending a couple of months home during COVID. That was an experience in itself, going to Australia during that time, uh, hotel quarantine, all of that. And I had 
a couple of months where I want, had the privilege of being able to step back and think about what was happening in, in global mental health and what I would do next. And I met with some friends who worked in climate and environment. And what I noticed was 20 years ago, they were doing almost what I'd been doing recently in mental health. They were campaigning and lobbying on the streets and doing the advocacy work on the streets of parliament and trying to get recycling into buildings. And they were the advocates. And now they were running the green finance funds. And the aha moment for me was how did they move climate from quite a far left issue for the advocates to being mainstreamed into business? Mm. And what are the things we have to build? And can we learn from, from the climate movement and accelerate and leapfrog some of that progress when it comes to mental health? I love that. And uh, that speaks very much to, have you read the book Range? No. So David, I highly recommend a friend of mine, David okay. Epstein, who was on the show, bestseller as well. He's a sports scientist mm. and actually analyzed like Tiger Woods and Roger Federer and their journeys. And we were always taught back in the day, even to today, 10,000 hours, focus on one thing, narrow down. Yeah. But his argument is, look at Roger Federer. We don't hear of this story, but he actually started doing squash, swimming, all of these things mm. and started later in life in tennis. But it actually provided him range because even like the, you think about so many innovations today, yeah. it actually took inspiration. Our friend James Rogers, yeah. he looked at stainless steel and asked himself, why couldn't this apply to food? Absolutely. Yeah. Love that. So highly recommend that. Well, then what's a book that you love that you recommend for everybody? There's a book called Crucial Conversations that when there's an, a conversation that needs to be had where the stakes are high, the emotions are high, yeah. and there's a difference in opinion how do you have that crucial conversation? Oh, love it. And this fill in the blank. Success is? Love. Money or power? Power. What still keeps you up at night? My dogs. What are you afraid of? The dark. What's your most used app in your phone right now? WhatsApp. What has aged you the most? Starting a charity. Mm, your life in one word. Full. And your legacy will be? Love. Wow. And with that, we end with love. <laughs> so we've come to the end, Alicia, and yes. this is the most important bit. If someone out there, someone tuning in is really struggling, where should they go and how can people find out more about you and your work? Yeah, thanks. It's important. I think it's during these conversations about mental health, some people might find it interesting mm -hmm. and that's fabulous and I hope it will spark some ideas for others it may bring up some questions in your own mind maybe you're struggling yourself with your own mental health or there's somebody in your life that's struggling and so we just encourage anyone that is struggling that there there is support you're not alone <laughs> um hope is possible and so what I would just encourage anyone to do who's struggling to reach out to a trusted friend um, or a local mental health professional and anyone maybe who's undertaken the Be There certificate or had that kind of training, just reach out for help as early as, as possible and don't be afraid to reach out for professional help. Um, for me, it was hugely helpful and there, there are ways to have received the support that you need. There's also, I just want to call out, there's um, at bekind.findahelpline.com, Born This Way Foundation has brought together a list of um, crisis lines or that you can call or text or go on online in on almost any country to receive help from someone confidentially and anonymously if that is the best approach for you but don't be please reach out for help yeah um, please talk about it and hopefully my story is an example that there is there is hope for future yeah. um, and where can people find you find us at prospera.global I think any funder who's thinking about having an impact in this space, we would love to talk to them yeah. um, and help them to really navigate where it's most needed and what's most effective or any company that's mm -hmm. struggling with what to do yeah. either with your, your staff or even consumers or your whole company on the strategy. Yeah. That's what we're doing a lot more of. And and I think anyone who wants to take action this World Mental Health Day, this is great. This is a simple thing you can do at cottonon.com. Uh, every single hat sold, 100% of proceeds will go to the B, to the Born This Way Foundation. I love that. And maybe buy them for your staff. Mobilize yeah. on the 10th. Uh, any action, we would love to see a movement around Kinder Braver together on Amazing. World Mental Health Day. Amazing. And we are kinder and braver together. And we're together. <laughs> and thanks so much for tuning in this week. 
You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and follow our socials on Sarah Chang Global to get the latest on the show. It would really help me out too if you enjoyed this to rate and review our show on Apple Podcasts and share your favorite episodes with a friend. I'm Sarah Chang Spellings and you've been listening to Villain Dollar Moves. <laughs>